Well, there is a, uh, a verse that says not to, we're, we're not to despise the day of small beginnings. Uh, little things can grow, and they do. I think of, uh, I was just reading this past week in John 3 about Nicodemus. Remember, he is a ruler of the Jews, and how he uh, came to Jesus at night because he was afraid. He didn't want to be seen going to see Jesus, a uh, man in his position that wasn't good. And so he was, we see his timidity, his, his fear, but nevertheless, he does go, and he asks Jesus some questions, and Jesus tells him about the necessity of being born again, and Nicodemus says, how can that be? And Jesus said, really? You're the teacher of Israel, and you don't understand these simple things? How in the world can you understand when I start teaching you heavenly things? And, but he emphasizes the importance of being uh, born from above, and uh, we see um, from that time of Nicodemus' faith being small, but from that small beginning, Nicodemus goes on to later. Uh, he actually stands up for Jesus in the high council. That was taking quite a risk. And then at the end, after all Christ's disciples had fled, here's Nicodemus again standing up for Christ and being willing, you know, can I take the body and bury it in this new rock-hewn tomb, being identified with Jesus in that way. So his faith started out quite small. It became something quite substantial and solid. And other things grow too. In the same way, for example, uh, uh, huge destructive so let's say forest fires don't just uh, you know, start out, uh, suddenly arrive in full force. They start out small you know, with a little spark and then it begins to grow. You know, all of us have seen pictures and you know, videos, whatever, of you know, these, uh, uh, you know, whether on the news or somewhere, maybe in person, uh, you know, th these how sad it is to see these raging forest fires that, you know, just burning up thousands of acres and, you know, including all the homes that are there too and the people who suffer loss and all that, you know, due to high winds or maybe dry conditions or a lot of combustible materials there, like a lot of downed trees, for example. You know, they all combine to create this fiery monster that soon just, you know, threatens every living thing in its path. But you know, all those uh, scary, huge fires, you know, all begin, you know, and progress along pretty predictable ways and stages. And I was just looking into this a little bit. They, uh, they starts off with uh, stage one, where they call it the incipient stage. This is just, you know, where the fire ignites. Uh, extremely dry conditions, maybe uh, high temperatures, and then just some kind of outside element, uh, and soon the, you know, the fire starts. That might be a uh, a half-finished uh, cigarette from somebody thrown out a window. There could be a, uh, uh, you know, a, a spark from some campfire. You know how that flight might fly up and land somewhere else. Or very often, very common, uh, a, a lightning strike will set these things off. And the fire starts. Uh, second comes the uh, growth stage where the small start begins to grow and build, of course. And uh, soon it becomes a flame and, and as soon as it starts its march across the land, even coming, turning into a, like a wall of fire. And then there's the third stage, which is a fully developed stage. This is the stage where the fire is at its hottest, its most dangerous. Uh, it spreads quickly. Sometimes I read where they can, it can travel up to 25 miles per hour. You know, it's faster than you can flee from it, uh, destroying everything in its path. And this is the stage where the firefighters most fear because they are afraid of the dreaded uh, flashover. This is where this wall of fire can leap over obstacles or even over a highway or over a river and come crashing down on the other side and perhaps on the firefighters who are there close trying to put this thing out. And then you have the fourth stage, you know, kind of the stage of decay where again the fire's winding down. And, uh, either got cooler or started to rain or just running out of stuff to burn. And uh, it's um, still though danger still lurks. All it takes is some small spark in a contained spot that can come alive and come roaring back again. But I say all that because uh, there was uh, a while back a book out called World of Flame, uh, sometime back written by uh, Billy Graham. And he really he was in a sense quite prophetic in that book. Because in that book, he describes that uh, he warns of a, uh, a time, a coming time in history when life as we know it would be consumed with evil, uh, is how he puts it. Just like a land can be consumed with fire. 
uh, that wave of evil, like a fire, will start small, perhaps even unnoticed, but it grows and it grows and it builds, and soon it, what can, that evil can blaze across and throughout our culture, across our cities, with terrible results. Uh, World of Flame, quite a title. You know, one could probably say that on uh, September 11, 2001, our country caught flame or caught fire. You know, when uh, the terrorists took and crashed uh, four planes, you know, two in New York City, one in Washington, D.C., into the Pentagon, and one ended up crashing out in the fields of Pennsylvania. Uh, but over 3,000 people died in those. And since then, I think you could say still, the winds are still blowing, and they're still blowing in our direction. Uh, you know, the flames of terrorism at home and abroad are, are out of control. You could rightly say that in, in the sense that our world is now on fire, and we, we want to survive, but how? In fact, just this past week, it caught my interest uh, Senator John McCain used this phrase, he said, we are living now in, the whole world is on fire. I thought, yeah, boy, that ties right in with what I wanted to speak. And so he recognizes that. You know, most of us were quietly going about our Thanksgiving uh, Day celebrations back in November 2015, when all of a sudden we saw the uh, shocking images of bodies strewn against this downtown uh, music concert hall in Paris how uh, several uh, hooded Islamic terrorists uh, stormed that concert hall and just opened fire and just gunned down a lot of people just in cold blood. And uh, you know, remember that? Um, it, was, it was gruesome. I mean, we really just couldn't believe it. It's kind of like, you know, it makes one stop and think, you know, if it can happen there, you know, it, it can happen here. I mean, if one is not safe even going to a music concert, how can one be safe going anywhere almost, or to a mall even? And yet now we know, of course, they've struck, you know, malls, struck malls, or that one, remember, or that one in Nairobi, and then just last fall, if you remember, up at the mall at St. Cloud, that was considered a terrorist attack, attack where one guy stabbed 10 people. And uh, even in Minneapolis, all across our country, Minneapolis is known as a hotbed of ISIS recruitment. So it's getting very close to home. Well, uh, and with that, keeping that in mind too, we uh, could say these raging fires of Islamic terrorism have grown into a fully developed fire. Uh, a fire of fear, of violence, of brutality, of complete disregard for life and decency. And in shock, many people are asking, you know, are you there, God? Uh, if you've lived for any length of time, you've been aware and you've uh, seen uh, presidential assassinations, you've heard of uh, political assassinations, there's these horrendous uh, suicide bomber attacks. Uh, we've seen our soldiers, brave men and women, fight these conflicts lately, you know, in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan and other places. Uh, we remember the deadly explosions in yeah, New York City, remember in the Boston Marathon, um, at our embassy in Benghazi. I mean, it just continues. And these, to name just a few, and these are only ones we've heard about. You know, are you there, God? And, uh, and then just when we think we've seen it all, uh, then you, there's been recently these uh, horrible beheadings of Christians and Muslims, uh, men and children, uh, brutally executed by ISIS and shown live on the internet, and all in the name of their demonic beliefs of rage and hatred and violence. You know, what once used to be just relegated to some warring tribal factions there in the Middle East for the last 1,500 years, ever since uh, Islam uh, was developed uh, and, and came about. You know, but now it's spread into, you could say, a fully developed fire of sickening evil and it's spreading fast across our world and we recognize that and the tactics they use to spread this uh, uh, help spread fear and terror through their uh, ongoing you know barbarous acts of random and repeated aggression again even hitting close to home and we just see there's no depth to which they won't sink in their attempts to throw more gasoline on this fire 
And as we uh, sit in our country and, and argue about such things as uh, transgender sex experimentation amongst grade school kids who absolutely do not know better and their brains aren't even developed yet, and, and we talk about and we talk, and we hear people talking all smug and oh how sophisticated we are now and we can do whatever we want and we don't realize how you know the moral center of our nation has become so mushy and and soft and 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 ill-defined uh, like marshmallow people and and people are confused about these things meanwhile the barbarians who are not confused about such things as that are gathering at our borders, waiting for a good time to attack again, but with greater impact and destruction. So, where to return for help? Indeed, it is a world of flame. And that's where we come to this verse. You know, besides the uh, courageous efforts of our armed forces and our police forces, where does a common man or woman turn for help these days? Can one find God in days like this? Yes, of course, one can. One certainly can. Uh, and there's something about the human heart that when the heat is put on, when the pressure is put on, that very often, not always, but very often, uh, their hearts will soften towards things of the Lord. You know, when, you, when, you're, when death might seem imminent or close, uh, things of eternal importance become much more important. Well, Solomon, the uh, wise king, once said this, he said, sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. Okay, that's good. But he also said in Ecclesiastes 7, enjoy, this is from uh, uh, the new, uh, I'm trying to think which translation I took this from, enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in this life, is one way to put it. You know, or some would say nothing certain except death and taxes, or I would add in God. But you know, when he says here that nothing is certain, it means that in this life, we don't know what will happen to us tomorrow. Uh, life is unpredictable, life is uncontrollable. And when life becomes unpredictable and uncontrollable, when people feel out of control, they become very anxious. They become very insecure. They become very fearful. And so I want to say, that's no reason whatsoever, though, to despair. There's no reason for despair because there is someone who does know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, and he always gets the last word. So there's no reason for despair. So in this uh, new short series, uh, as we look at this overall topic of finding hope, you know, in these chaotic times, uh, we're going to especially look at Psalm 46. We'll, we'll look at some other verses, too. But we're going to see what hope, what comfort, what strength, what faith can be found even in when the world around us is aflame. Uh, we'll see again what uh, great hope is found in that first verse that we just read, where it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That's good news. That's great news. And so it, I could ask this, you know, have you found that to be true? I like what I, I, I heard, um, I read one thing this week, this guy, one guy said, put it this way. He said, it's funny because we ask God to change our situation. We do that all the time. Uh, we ask God to change our situation, not knowing he has put us in the situation to change us. And there's a lot of truth to that. Well, so whether your life is maybe in chaos for some other reasons or whatever, or it's just the, uh, as we see this, uh, the raging fires of terrorism uh, strike ever closer, we're going to look, we'll see and discover anew, again, the, the safety and the refuge and the hope there is in a relationship with God, in a personal relationship with the living God. Is there hope? Yes, there's hope. In fact, I like... Uh, uh, one way I define hope, H-O-P-E, is uh, hanging on to promises expectantly. God's given us very gracious and many and mighty promises that he expects us to claim and use and stand on and stand firm on. And when we do, we won't despair. 
we will find great hope. And so that's some of the things we're going to look at here as we continue. But I'm going to uh, stop there so we have time for uh, communion. Also, I see there's a plate set out in the back, a benevolent plate. Feel free if you want to give to that afterwards. Uh, We just use that to help meet uh, needs that we become aware of. You know, let me uh, just read this. In John uh, 3.15, he says this. Um, I'll start at verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, you might remember that story, uh, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. He's speaking about his death on the cross. That whoever, and he puts it very plainly, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And so, in thinking about communion and thinking about this verse, yes, it's true. I mean, the cross of Christ means everything. Uh, the history changed at that point. Our destinies changed uh, at that point. Because it's true, yes, we are sinners. In fact, First John 1, it says, if you say you're not a sinner, that's the same thing as calling God a liar. Well, we don't want to do that. We're, we're, it's obvious. We know we're sinners, but the good news is Christ has suffered for us. Yes, we know that we deserve death. That's the consequence of sin, it's death. We deserve that. But Christ died for us. And we know we are guilty debtors, of one, another way to put it, because of our sin. But the good news is Christ has paid our debt for us by shedding his blood on the cross, by dying for us. See, that's the gospel. That's the good news. That we were in a terrible shape. Yes, we really were. Whether we realized it or not, we really were. But that's why God sent his son, his only begotten son, to die on the cross so that now all who look to him, as it says, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And that's what we celebrate here in communion. We uh, we remember that. And like Jesus said, we are to do this until he returns. And so communion, the Lord's Supper, uh, it's it's a very simple affair. It's not complicated, uh, but it's very meaningful. It reminds us again of the gospel, of what Jesus did for us. And through these very physical elements of uh, drinking the, the juice and uh, the cup and, and then of the, uh, of the bread here or the wafers here. And here-